When you think about organized crime, it's not intuitive that Africa would be a focus. But from the illegal wildlife trade to human smuggling and oil theft, to blood diamonds, piracy and drug smuggling, Africa is increasingly becoming webbed into the global illicit economy. In this new podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, we not only examine the flows of illicit commodities, but also look at the enabling environment that has made Africa vulnerable to the growth of organized crime. You're listening to the third episode of Africa and the Global Illicit Economy, exploring organized crime on the African continent with the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. The GI is uniquely positioned to bring you expert analysis on the illicit economy in Africa in new episodes twice a month. For each episode, we focus on a specific region of the continent covered by the GI's observatories. This week, we're in North Africa. And in this episode, we move away from drugs and weapons to look at illicit commodity smuggling in the Maghreb and Sahel. That is an incredibly diverse group of goods. It really is is hard to put a bound on that. Anything from Hello Kitty backpacks to makeup to tea glasses to racehorses and bulldogs. We'll explore the range of products moved between borders, how smuggling is accomplished, why it's economically important, and how state officials deal with, tolerate, and police it. Since the Arab Spring uprisings and the series of revolutions that followed in North Africa, nations in the region have adopted a new approach to managing their borders. In the past, borders were relatively porous and regulated by a combination of regional security forces and border communities. But post-2011, increased drugs and arms smuggling in Libya and Northern Mali prompted North African governments to turn to the Western model of more aggressive, tech-driven approaches to border security. While Western governments supported these efforts with funds and resources, borderland communities struggled. In North Africa, borderland communities who've been ignored by governments that focus on developing the interior rely on the smuggling of basic goods as an ad hoc form of development. So how are these communities finding ways around this militarized security approach? Max Galin, a political scientist specializing in the political economy of the Middle East and North Africa. This type of development that we've seen in the border regions is not necessarily sustainable. The political center has chosen for these regions by not providing it with other alternatives and by being involved in the structuring and regulation of these type of activities. But it has also increasingly been visible in the last couple of years that this is still a form of development that the states themselves also don't control entirely because it's also dependent on conditions beyond their own control. Max, can you give us an example of how smuggling along North Africa's borders works? Who are the transporters and what arrangements are involved? An interesting case has been the borders between the Spanish enclaves, so Ceuta and Melilla in northern Morocco and Morocco itself. The way smuggling across those borders used to happen is that a large part of it was organized by a small number of wholesale smugglers who would store large numbers of goods in warehouses near the border. These goods had been shipped into the port of Melilla, and they would then be packed into bundles that were wrapped up with white plastic and tape, and they would be brought near the border where a large group of transporters each would pick up one of these bundles. And alongside the bundles, they would get a little ticket, which would have both the type of goods that they're transporting but also the boss they were working for. And they would then work these bundles through an iron turnstile across the border, despite the fact that this was A, entirely illegal, and B, completely observed by security forces from both sides. And on the other side of that border would handle that bundle back to someone who worked for the same wholesaler. And interesting enough, the ticket they were holding would serve two functions. It would A, show to someone on the other side of the border what types of goods they were bringing and who they were working for, but it would also show to the border guards that they were part of a regulated smuggling arrangement, that the fee for their particular instance of of breaking that law had been paid as a flat rate by their wholesaler. So we see something that's that's incredibly regulated and structured, but something that's still incredibly labor intensive because it's, it's really only one of these bundle of goods that one person can bring through at a time. So this smuggling is happening under the eye of state authorities. Why do governments tolerate these activities? 
when you talk to people in the security services or local bureaucrats, the key reason that always comes up is social pressures. It's preventing unrest. It is just like one local politician buying the peace in the borderlands. And I think if we go back a little bit into the region's history and its state building processes, that is a very, very common pattern. We often see that, especially after independence, formal rent streams, formal investments are um, across the region are concentrated in the political and economic centers, especially along the coast. And we often see a vast economic neglect of its borderlands and its periphery. And we see from early independence on the development of these types of informal deals and informal arrangements where the center doesn't invest in the periphery, but it allows these types of activities to develop and to happen, although with a certain amount of regulation and interference. What proof is there that these networks are actually vital to borderland communities? I think the best proof we have for that is that every time these type of networks do collapse, we see unrest, we see protests in the borderlands, we see high spikes in employment in the borderlands, we see migration out of the borderlands. So I think it's playing a fundamentally stabilizing, economic stabilizing role, despite all its issues for local populations as well in these regions. And that's why it's incredibly hard for states to crack down on. And I think that's why all the rhetoric around smuggling in the last few decades, it has been a constant for a lot of that. It's worth mentioning that the borderlands aren't the only ones being paid off here and that there are also other payments going on. There are elites benefiting from this as well. There are people in the security forces benefiting from this as well. And I'm not trying to diminish that. I'm not trying to pretend that that's not happening. But I think the vast employment opportunities for regions that don't have another opportunity is, is a really key factor here. You've alluded to the fact that smuggling systems have started to change. Can you explain why this shift has occurred? There's not been one single change. And I think a certain awareness by states in the region that this is something that they're still somewhat reliant on for their own stability is still there. But there's been a couple of shifts in the last decade that has upped the pressure on borderlands quite substantively. One of them, I think, is international pressure and international concern around migration, around mobility. And this is both in the context of especially post-2015, the increasing interest by European actors in migration in the region, but also especially since 9-11 and the so-called war on terror and increasing concern with the availability of weapons in the region, but also the ability of certain actors to cross borders without being noticed, and without being traced. So I think there's been an enormous increase in international attention to this issue, which has gone along with some pressure on states in the region. What about conflict and the economic situation in the region? What effects have they had on smuggling networks? There's also been the, the war in Libya and the increasing flow of arms around the region of Libya and the wider conflicts in the Sahel, which I think have heightened the attention of states in the region to the security and fortification of their own borders. Changes in oil price and the wider economic situation in the region, I think, also have made some states in the region a little less tolerant to the mass outflux of subsidized gasoline across their borders. So this is especially Algeria and Libya, who've seen quite a lot of their gasoline cross their borders into Egypt, into Tunisia, into Libya and into their southern neighbors. The somewhat ironic thing, if we look at the various pressures that we've seen on borders, the various new fortifications that have been installed in the last few years, is that exactly these things that all these fortifications were intended to crack down upon, we haven't seen decrease quite as much. We've seen a lot of the, the survivalist activities. We've seen the gasoline smuggling collapse along vast borders in the region. We've seen a lot of the food smuggling as the guys bringing eggs and tomatoes across collapse, while we've seen a lot less interference to the movements of arms and narcotics, for example. How is it that drugs and narcotics have managed to survive these crackdowns, but commodities like food have not? That has something to do with what a border fortification does to smuggling across a border. The key effect of a border fortification is that it increases the costs of getting across. And that is either the costs of paying your way across through investing more heavily in your relationship with local actors and the security forces through bribery, through bribing at higher levels across the command chain, or through the investing the technology that you need to either make your goods harder to detect as you bring them across to explore different routes or to use technology to get across infrastructure itself. And I think there's a heterogeneity in which networks are able to afford these new costs. So your, your farmer who has a, a farm somewhere near the border and has been smuggling eggs across as another little form of income is not going to be able to invest in any of these measures to get in, in, around a new border fortification. A lot of the smaller actors are not going to be able to do that. The larger actors are. 
And I think that's a key distinction that a lot of the networks that we're seeing who are trading in what we call the more illicit goods, so your narcotics or, or guns, are a lot more heavily capitalized. They're able to make these payments. They're able to either buy their way up or invest in the technology to get around it. So it seems that these networks for smuggling drugs and arms are now becoming more sophisticated. That is one concerning effect of these infrastructures, that it often cuts off the type of actors that are responsible for stability locally, and it doesn't do a good enough job in cutting across the actors that we really want to crack down on. The other concerning effect is that it motivates undercapitalized networks to capitalize more heavily. So if you are a drug smuggling network, for example, that was able to operate in a somewhat decentralized fashion, was not heavily capitalized, had not really invested in local relationships because it was quite easy to get across the border, I think an increasing border fortification, if not embedded in a wider strategy of developing locally, if not embedded in a wider strategy of thinking about how these networks work, would then motivate a network like that to invest more heavily in corruption, to invest more heavily in infrastructure and and technology, and potentially arm itself more aggressively in order to be able to confront security forces. So not only are we cracking down on survivalist networks, not only are we not effective enough at deterring some of the more illicit networks, but I think we're also worryingly potentially setting incentives for illicit networks to form cartels, to consolidate their power, and to invest more heavily in potentially security infrastructure as well. What has the impact of this crackdown been on the livelihoods of these border communities? It's been the most brutal and I think under-discussed and under-observed shock to peripheral regions. The key effect is really about unemployment. Across the region, really, we've seen an enormous shock to these networks and we've seen rising unemployment in borderlands. And I think it's very hard to get a sense of where that's going to leave these regions in the future. But I think if there's no real alternative that develops, we are creating extreme pockets of of poverty, of exclusion in these regions and very little way out. So in your view, is this form of smuggling along the borderlands important to development? Smuggling is regulated across the regions. States are involved in regulation of smuggling across the region, at least for illicit goods. And almost across all this regulation, we see that it's purposefully made to be labor intensive. Everybody can only bring one bundle across. Or in the Tunisia-Libya border, if you drive a car across, you can only use a certain type of car to bring goods across. You can't use a massive truck to smuggle. And that has been a part of the negotiation locally. So when the regulation of smuggling was renegotiated locally. There was pressure locally to make sure that you can only use a certain type of car to smuggle because that will maintain a certain labor intensity of smuggling. And as a consequence, it has certainly created employment for large sections of border regions. And as a consequence, it has contributed some form of economic development. So this development is unsustainable. If there is a post-war Libya, I think it is quite likely that the rise of a potential post-war effective Libyan state will no longer be interested in tolerating the smuggling out of vast quantities of its gasoline into Tunisia. At that point, the Tunisian strategy of partially funding its borderlands through the smuggling of gasoline from Libya will collapse. So Tunisia's strategy for its own borderlands is somewhat dependent on Libya. Or as Morocco found out the hard way, its strategy of sustaining some of its northern borderlands has been dependent on the toleration of smuggling on the Algerian side as well. So one way in which this type of development is is certainly unsustainable is that states can't entirely control how long it lasts. It's dependent on their neighbors as well. And given the uncertain politics of the regions in the last couple of years, more often than not, states all of a sudden find themselves with these types of informal forms of development collapsing without their own intention to do so. But I think more importantly, this type of development comes with adverse consequences for those involved in it as well. Just because we see people work as smugglers, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were born wanting to be smugglers. It's often the only feasible type of employment available or the most attractive type of employment available. But it often comes with adverse consequences for them as well. Max, in your opinion, what is the answer? Should there be a gradualist approach to the crackdown on smuggling that transitions into a sustainable formal economy? 
So the answer to that is, I think that there needs to be a dual process of A, engaging selectively and carefully with smuggling networks and beginning to move against these activities in a coordinated but careful and well-analyzed way, but at the same time, create formal alternatives. And that is a struggle because smuggling economies have left a certain legacy in these regions. They've left a legacy in terms of what people are used to earning, what type of activities they're used to engage with. It's left a legacy in terms of what age people usually leave school at. We see, especially in rural border regions, people leaving school at a very, very early age to go and engage in cross-border trade sometimes with their family. And all of this creates huge challenges for creating formal economies in border regions. That was Max Galin, a political scientist specializing in the political economy of the Middle East and North Africa. What happens when smuggled goods are needed to save lives? Mismanagement in the Libyan health sector has led to a shortage in medicine, exacerbated by the 2011 civil war. The violence that ensued brought with it attacks on healthcare centers, violence against healthcare workers, and looted medical equipment that undercut the nation's fragile healthcare system. Combined with weak links in the control and management of the medical supply chain in Tunisia, this has opened the door for the trafficking of medicines into Libya by organized criminal networks. How is it that Tunisian pharmaceuticals became so crucial to the Libyan health sector? Shihan Benyaya is a research consultant on organized crime in North Africa. The demand in Libya could not have been met by any other country in the region. So it's not by chance that Tunisia is the main supplier of this medicine. In fact, Tunisia has a, a strong local pharmaceutical sector. It benefits from a high level of local productions, which accounts for more than 50% of the total medicine sale in the country, and a high level of local production in terms of quality and quantity. All of this have helped Tunisia to meet an important proportion of the legal sub-regional demand. Despite a strongly regulated domestic medicine supply chain. The health sector actually in Tunisia is facing also huge governance challenges. What kind of medicines constitute the bulk of pharmaceuticals trafficked from Tunisia into Libya? According to the UN, more than 70% of Libyans are currently suffering from chronic disease. So let's take the example of insulin. Since 2013-2014, people suffering from diabetes could no longer obtain insulin in public health center, and they had therefore to rely on its availability on the private market. But as a result, the price of the drug increased dramatically. It peaked at 50 Libyan dinners for 10 milliliters in late 2015 from seven Libyan dinners in early 2014. This is the same situation also for high blood pressure medicines or even chemotherapy that are highly demanded and constitute at the end a stable and constant source of income for those who are involved in the smuggling of these medicines. But because also of the high number of people injured in the conflict, anesthetics and surgical materials constitute also an important part of this trade. Today, it is estimated that a million people are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder in Libya and also serious depression because of the exposure to the violence and to the conflict. So therefore, painkillers also and sleeping tablets have been brought also illegally to Libya. And you have might also heard about the huge quantities of tramadol, which is an opioid painkiller that were also allegedly linked to terrorist groups. What about the networks that keep this going? Who are the major institutions involved in the smuggling chain? There are two major institutions involved in this chain. There is the Ministry of Health, who have the monopoly to deliver the entry to market authorization for any imported or locally produced medicines, and the Central Pharmacy of Tunisia, who has the monopoly to import medicines and to supply imported and locally produced medicines at the local level. Despite the strong regulatory framework, there is a lack of effective control at various level of the medicine supplies change, which make this chain very vulnerable to theft and embezzlement. And what are the points of entry for smuggled medicine? Thanks to our field work, we have identified three points of entry. The step in the chain during which the central pharmacy stores this imported and locally produced medicine before distributing them to public hospitals or wholesalers or private pharmacies. There, there is a high risk of theft and diversion. Then the second entry point or vulnerability stage is at the level of storage at regional hospitals. Their medicines distributed are stored, but typically the storage areas are 
fully secured and a huge lack of control, which really increased opportunities for theft and misappropriation. And then at the level of private pharmacies sales, it's very hard to track or to report uh, medicines that are sold by private pharmacy. Typically in Tunisia, you can purchase many types of medicines without the prescription, or you can use one prescription by many, many times the same medicines and, and you can repeat it. So there seems like there would also need to be coordination between actors on both the Tunisian and Libyan side of the exchange. So the embezzlement involves various actors who divert this medicines from the legal medicine supply chain in Tunisia and then illegally trade it to Libya. So the first part of the operations involves some individuals within the public and the private sectors that are involved in the medicine supply chain. Here, most of these actors are Tunisian. They are taking part into a whole parallel medicine supply chain. They know each other. They're doing it with the consciousness that these medicines will be smuggled and they are taking part into important financial advantages. Then, at a more individual level, there were also some reports about Libyan citizens that are specifically sent to Tunisia, for example, to purchase important quantities of medicine. This is the first step. The second step, it's when medicines stolen or illegally purchased are transported and stored in various locations around the tunis sfax Bengarden corridor. There, the medicines are illegally exported along the traditional smuggling route by smugglers in the well-known region of Bengarden. And there, law enforcement are variously either not able to detect the smuggled medicines or not willing to do so. Considering that the trade in medicine is not a security priority, what implications does it have for border security? It poses huge risk on medicine quality and on health security. Embezzled medicines are stored before being smuggled, often in conditions that are absolutely not compliant with medicine storage's process. So many of these are expired. This is the first thing. The second thing is that the medicines that are seized by the Tunisian authorities do not follow a proper process for disposing them. And what we've heard is that unlike narcotic drugs, medicines are not destroyed and it has been even reported, in reality, seized medicines are redistributed to local hospitals in Tunisia, which under conditions, we have no clue about that. It's a big, big problem in terms of health security. It actually does challenge border security because at the end, it's a smuggling activity and the smugglers of medicines in Tunisia have to build connections with groups that control territory in Libya. Last but not least, it also fuels corruptions and it challenges the Tunisian democratic institutions. At the end, everyone is well aware of the situation, but financial interests are prevailing and there is not a real effort to stop or to dismantle or to slow down the embezzlement of medicines. And Shihan, finally, can you tell us about the rise in the smuggling of counterfeit drugs? In North Africa, the issue of counterfeit medicines has not been very prevailing for a long time, and it's probably the much spared region in the continent. But according to many people we have interviewed, counterfeit seems to be on the rise. But the thing is that I would say the positive aspect in this potential rise of counterfeit drugs is the smugglers seem to be aware of the potential profit that could be made on counterfeit medicines, but they seem more reluctant and even refusing to engage in this practice because they consider it as prescribed by the religion and that it's a bad thing for their Libyan brothers and they are absolutely aware of the danger. That was Jihan Ben Yahia, a research consultant on organized crime in North Africa. For centuries, trans-Saharan trade has provided a livelihood for communities across North Africa. In the 8th century, camel caravans traveled thousands of kilometers through sand dunes and empires that rose and fell. With them, they carried salt from the West African coast to trade for gold in Timbuktu. Since the start of the independence era, food smuggling, fueled by an influx of cars and low barriers to entry for entrepreneurial youth, has become a financial lifeline in economically depressed borderland communities. But today, in the era of increased border securitization in countries like Algeria, Mali and Niger, this carefully developed industry is struggling to survive. Raoul Farah, 
a senior analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Small-scale smuggling is very important for communities because the lack of development, the lack of economic opportunities, the lack of stable jobs makes these opportunities the only ones to fund the revenue and gain a livelihood. And in Algeria in particular, these basic goods are still subsidized by the Algerian regime. So the prices differentials between northern Mali and southern Algeria are still important, which gives opportunities for, uh, for youngsters to move goods and transport goods. Over the last five years, or even the last decade, the small-scale smuggling of goods and commodities has been highly undermined by law enforcement and securitization. This securitization has undermined the activities of real traffickers and organized crime networks involved in drugs trafficking and arms trafficking beyond Algeria's borders. But it also hits significantly the small-scale economies of basic goods. Rolf, when you say young transporters are finding ways around the securitization, can you explain exactly how and which actors and processes are being utilized? So commodities arrive in Taman Rasset and then they are either transported legally to the borderlands of Tinzawatin, Timiawin, these are two villages, or the city of Burj Baji Mahtar on the Malian side. There is also on the Nigerian side a city called Ain Gaza, which is about five hours from Tamarasset. So transporters, they carry these basic goods to the borderlands for communities. That's in theory. In practice, most of basic commodities arriving in these areas are smuggled to Mali and Niger. In Ain Gaza, for instance, on the Nigerian side of the border, every morning people gather in the main road of the city. It's called Tariq al Hwanit, and they charge, they load Toyotas, Land Rovers. And on the Algerian uh, Nigerian side, at least before COVID, locals who live in Ain Gazam were authorized to move on the other side, to the other side of the border, if they show a state document called Passavant. So, this is a document allowing them to send goods and basic commodities to their families on the other side. And that's a way for the Algerian regime to indirectly support communities in northern Niger and northern Mali. So people charge their vehicles and they go in the morning on the other side of the border. They don't reach the cities of Aglit or Agades for most of them. They stop in a sort of no man's land in the desert between Algeria and Niger called al Akla. So Al Akla isn't just a transit point, it also operates as a sort of smuggler's marketplace. This area is a typical spot of these hidden places in the Sahara where mobility and trade are intertwined. Most of the time, people don't have the state documents to move beyond the borders. So there are some corrupt uh, arrangements that can be set up at the border with, with officers. Most of them get back to Ain Gazam the same day because you're not allowed to enter by night. To what extent is the Al Akla market policed? Are authorities aware of the illegal trade happening within the market? Yes, they are aware of what's going on in Al Akla. I interviewed myself, one of the law enforcement officers in Ain Gazam, and I asked him, you see every morning about 100 to 200 vehicles leave the city and get back by night. Are you aware about what's happening? His reply was very straightforward. He was, we know what's happening, but this is not our, our area of concern. This is the area of concern of, of Nigerians. But it's just another example of how the state is turning a blind eye on these markets. Are these young entrepreneurs willing to transport anything? So, for instance, if they feel more protected working within a network of organized criminals that has more power to navigate security, might they shift from transporting basic food items to perhaps drugs or weapons? My analysis of the idea of diversification of markets from transporters perspective is that most of the people that I interviewed myself have shown no willingness basically to switch to more criminal markets such as for instance hashish or, or even cocaine. Some of them have expressed some concerns about restrictions imposed by the Algerian states and some logisticians, so people who are involved in the preparation of the smuggling journey, I would say, have shown willingness to get involved into markets from which they can extract more important rent. That was Raul Farah, Senior Analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime.
That's it for this episode of Africa and the Global Illicit Economy. We'd like to thank Max Galin, Shihan Ben Yahya and Rahu Farah. If you want to check out more content on illicit economies in Africa, such as After the Storm, Organized Crime Across the Sahel Sahara, following upheaval in Libya and Mali, head over to our website, www.globalinitiative.net. There are plenty of publications to keep you informed. You can also find last week's podcast on unintended consequences, charcoal, wine and dows, along with many other podcasts. You'll hear from us again in two weeks. Until then, this podcast was produced by Alexandria Sahai Williams. I'm Lindy Mtongana. Thanks for listening. During the 21st century, thousands of criminal assassinations have occurred worldwide. They produce a butterfly effect of trauma locally, nationally, regionally, and globally. Despite these efforts to silence, criminal assassinations can be a source of hope and community resilience. He had a fire in him. He couldn't stand corruption, and he wouldn't stop after exposing it. She was such a force of nature that when I first met her, I came away a bit shaken, a bit intimidated. He was a very pleasant, modest, and humble person who dreamt about a time when all criminals would pay for their deeds. She taught us the fear paralyzed actions of the people. We will never give up, even if we got killed, even if they murder us. They didn't didn't die. die. They multiplied. Thousands of brave souls have paid with their lives because they refused to tolerate criminal governance. In 2019, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime commissioned approximately 50 profiles of persons assassinated across the world under the Faces of Assassination project. These profiles highlight places where organized crime has permeated political, cultural and economic sectors of society. Check out our website and join the campaign.